Golden Circle proudly presents. You like spy movies, Mr. DeVille? Oh, when I was a kid, that was my dream job. Gentleman spy. Welcome to Now Playing's Kingsman Retrospective Series. We are the first independent intelligence agency. Refined but brutal. Part of our Marvel Movie Retrospective Series. This is going to be fun. Hosted by Jacob. Your reputation precedes you. Stuart. Huge IQ, great performance at school. And Arnie. <laughs> oh, you know your shit. This podcast will contain detailed movie spoilers and harsh language. It's very American. <laughs> Fuck you. Listener discretion is advised. Symbol, the Kingsman. Today, we're discussing Argyle, starring Henry Cavill, Bryce Dallas Howard, Sam Rockwell, Brian Cranston, Catherine O'Hara, Dua Lipa, with John Cena, and Samuel L. Jackson, directed by Matthew Vaughn. This is the now playing co-host who makes Darth Vader look like Mary Poppins, Arnie. And Stuart. And this is the co-host with the perfect name for a very cool cat, Jacob. (laughs) <laughs> and you spell it cool, too, with the K. <laughs> all right, I'll ask, why are we covering this movie four months after it flopped in theaters? Because I saw it in theaters. This was honestly when I was looking at 2024 in film. This film was my most anticipated film. Furiosa was number two, but this was my top thirst film. Did you see the trailer? Because I saw that cat, that CGI cat. I'm like, nope, this is not the movie for me. Not because I dislike cats, prefer cats over dogs, but because of that stupid CGI cat mugging at the screen. I thought it was funny, and it made me want to see this film more. In fact, if you guys know, AMC does the screen unseen thing where they show a movie, you don't know what it is, and you only pay $5 and you get to see a movie before it's released. I was stalking Reddit to see if one of those movies would be Argyle just so I could see this film a week before it was supposed to be in theaters. That's how anxious I was for Argyle. Because it's Matthew Vaughn? Because it's Matthew Vaughn and because it looked like a movie as fun as the original Kingsman. And it turns out it's connected to that universe. I went and saw this movie in theaters too, although I had mixed feelings about it. I do like Matthew Vaughn. I didn't like the trailer, but I felt like I could trust him. And I'll just go ahead and share, I did not stay for any mid-credits or end credit. I, there was no staying for anything. Yeah, you don't know this is Kingsman if you don't stay for the credits. I bolted. As soon as I could get out of the theater, I ran. And Arnie had to be the one to tell me that there is a scene where some character ends up in the King's Man. And I thought, well, what does that mean? Do we need to blow up the schedule and put it on in February? We ended up deciding to hold on to it. It's now streaming and doing quite well out in the streaming numbers on Apple Plus. Here it is. We're putting it out in summer, which I guess it feels like a summer movie. It's an action film. I remember texting you because I saw it and just my heart went into my stomach of like, should we have been reviewing this? God knows because I wanted to see this movie so badly. I would have loved to have put it on the schedule no matter but I wouldn't have planned on putting Kingsman credits at the beginning of the show. But yeah, I saw the end credits stinger, texted Stuart, like, do we have to review this now? (laughs) It was a real debate. And in the end, we just didn't have any room and other things were going on. And nobody really asked. Again, I'm going to stress the fact that this movie costs Apple Plus $200 to make, and it internationally grossed less than $100 Actually... Matthew Vaughn disputes that price tag. Apple Plus paid $200 million for it. This thing was filmed in 2021, was already produced by Marv, and then it was sold to Apple and Universal for distribution. But Matthew Vaughn says it cost well under $200 million. Yeah, I, I hope they didn't pay $200 million for that CGI. They think that that 
200 million may include the 80 million in marketing that they did. Okay, but well, fair enough. It was not seen as a money maker. And it's doubly hurtful because they were trying to tie this thing to Taylor Swift. You talk about the cat, but apparently, what do I know about Taylor Swift? But her fans had theorized because she popularized that cat backpack. That's all it took to create a conspiracy about Taylor Swift was a backpack? And the type of cat. Apparently, it's a type of cat popularized by Taylor Swift. It was theorized that she wrote it, that this was her foray into screenwriting. And so even that didn't get people into theaters. I would believe it's a first time screenwriter. (laughs) That is worth pointing out. This is not coming from Matthew Vaughn's pen or keyboard. It is written by Jason Fuchs, whose greatest credit is Ice Age 3. Well, what happened was they started to say that this was actually based on a book and it was a book written by Ellie Conway. And in September 2022, The Hollywood Reporter tried to find Ellie Conway and couldn't find her, her publicist, her talent agent, couldn't find anything about it. And so then they were wondering, did Taylor Swift write the book using Ellie Conway as a pen name? (laughs) It's so sad because, you know, her concert movie, like, made three times what this movie made. (laughs) And yeah, if it actually had been true... God knows they would have, yeah, made a super profit. We'd already have a sequel, but it just seems like a way of trying to sell a turkey by saying, oh, you have to watch it if you're a Taylor Swift fan. And it couldn't be worse than Cats, right? I mean, she has no luck in the movies. (laughs) No one asked for another Amsterdam. But Matthew Vaughn, yes, he is a draw. I was happy to see. I mean, I was hoping it would be like Kingsman. But there was reasons to feel like it wouldn't be, including the fact he didn't write the script. That trailer! (laughs) And the trailer wasn't that funny. And here's a really big one. The PG-13 rating. I mean, one thing about Matthew Vaughn at his best is he'll shock you. He's a shock comic. The things that happen in that first Kingsman movie particularly are a grabber and are rated and intense. And to dilute that in any way seemed like a mistake. Yeah, think of the first kick-ass film and imagine it at (laughs) PG-13, and you just can't do it. All the best parts of that movie were hard R-rated. But you know what? I still came in optimistic. I still came in because it is Matthew Vaughn, because the trailer did remind me of Kingsman, and because, hey, it's Sam Rockwell. I love Sam Rockwell. He's one of my favorite actors working today. So I still was there opening weekend ready to see this film. And I was excited to find out Sam Rockwell was in this. I guess I do kind of remember him from that trailer, but I thought this was a Henry Cavill, John Cena film. Like, that's what the trailers really sold me, is it was all about them and then this writer that they would be protecting or something. That's going to be a big shock to find out how little they're in this. You think so? Because the movie is definitely sold as having big surprises. I remember I had to watch that trailer before every movie around Christmas time. They just heavily hit. I always saw that trailer and everything was like, you'll never guess who the real Agent Argyle is. Yeah, I guessed it right away. Yes, exactly. I don't think there's a whole lot of surprise. I think that if you introduce the idea that there's a twist, it's pretty easy to see it coming. Did not see the twist of this movie coming. I can't say. I mean, I, I didn't go in thinking about a twist. I wasn't looking for a twist. Who is Agent Argyle? Yeah, that was the big part of the trailer. Yeah, you didn't have a question that who it could... You know it's not Henry Cavill. You know that he's not the real one. We'll talk about it as we go through, but my mind went in very different directions. All right, well then let's start talking. Arnie, give us the plot. Bryce Dallas Howard plays Ellie Conway, writer of the hit Argyle series of spy novels. Her books aren't just bestsellers, They've actually accurately predicted real-world geopolitical events. At the start of the movie, Ellie has just finished the fifth novel in the series, but her mother, Ruth, played by Catherine O'Hara, thinks the book's ending is unsatisfying. Ellie, who is afraid of flying, takes a train to visit her parents and work on the novel's conclusion. On the train, Ellie is attacked by a number of unknown bad guys. Ellie is saved by Sam Rockwell's character, Aiden Wilde, an actual spy. After escaping, Aiden explains to Ellie that her books are more accurate than even she knows, as there's an evil rogue spy agency called The Division, much like the one she wrote in her books. 
The Division wants to capture Ellie to find out what her next book will predict about their future. Her fifth book ended with Agent Argyle arranging to obtain a master file that would expose the Division, which was happening in real life with Aiden. Aiden hopes that Ellie can write the next chapter, telling him where that master file has gone, as the hacker who obtained it never showed up for their meeting. Ellie successfully finds the hacker's hideout, but not the hacker himself. The Division follows Ellie's movements and sends waves of enemies after her, but she and Aiden are able to escape. While on the run, Ellie hears Aiden talk on the telephone about killing her, so she leaves him and goes to meet her parents, who have come to London to help their daughter. However, it's revealed that Ellie's parents aren't really Ellie's parents. Her father is Director Ritter, head of the Division, played by Brian Cranston. Ellie's mother, Ruth, is the head of the Division's PSYOPs division. Aiden saves Ellie from these two operatives and takes Ellie to France to meet a spy named Alfie, played by Samuel L. Jackson. Alfie reveals Ellie's past. She was actually a spy, real name Rachel Kyle, or R. Kyle. Her books have been based on actual missions she went on as a secret agent. Her partner and lover was Aiden. Ellie was involved in an explosion that wiped her memory, so the Division brought in the head of PsyOps, Ruth, to brainwash Ellie into thinking they were her parents, and she had an ice skating accident. Ellie has lived that falsehood for five years, writing five books. The Division wants to know about the Master File as it could expose their identities. Alfie wants the Master File so he can bring down the Division. And Ellie remembers the hacker gave the Master File to secret keeper Saba al-Badir, who will only give the file to Ellie. Ellie and Aiden go to the Arabian Peninsula and retrieve the file, but are captured by Ruth and other Division agents, including Chief Assassin Carlos. Ellie wakes up on a Division oil tanker, where it's revealed that Ellie, or Rachel, was a double agent working for the Division. Her memories fully restored now, Ellie pretends to help Director Ritter. Ritter got the master file when he captured Ellie, but now he wants the secret location of Alfie, who is the Division's biggest threat. Ellie pretends to help get the information from Alfie, but it's a ruse. Ellie, or Rachel, was a triple agent, only pretending to work for the Division. Ellie and Aiden team up to kill all the Division goons, including Carlos, and then they kill Director Ritter. They go to transfer the master file from the Division's servers to Alfie, but are interrupted by Ruth. Ruth programmed some Manchurian Candidate-type shit in Ellie's head, and when she plays a music box, Ellie is completely under Ruth's mind control. Ellie attacks Aiden, who won't fight back against the woman he loves. Ellie almost kills Aiden when Ruth is knocked out and the music box broken. This was done by Kira, a partner of Ellie and Aiden's who was presumed killed years earlier. Kira had been working for the Division for years, waiting for a moment to bring them down. Alfie gets the master file, and we see Ellie went back to her novelist life publishing books 5 and 6, but at a book signing event, Ellie gets a question from a man who reveals himself to be the real Agent Argyle, played by Henry Cavill. And in a mid credit scene, we see a young Agent Argyle, revealed to be a Kingsman agent. And making us do this podcast. <laughs> as credits roll. And as credits start, I'm bopping out. I love some funk. Some Barry White, my first, my last, my everything. Love this song. All right, so Henry Cavill, maybe our most unfortunate current actor. They won't let him do anything, right? He can't be <laughs> Superman. He can't be James Bond. They're obviously playing on the joke of what it would be like if he had actually landed the role of 007. He is playing almost a parody of that sort of swinging sexual... It's, it's a little bit Austin Powers, is it not? It's that hairdo they give him, that almost flat top with the bleached hair in there. And the green felt Nehru collar suit. Like, everything about it isn't cool. You wouldn't watch this scene and go, oh, wow, I want to watch an Argyle movie. You see it as derivative and kind of mocking of the Ian Fleming James Bond legacy. Or at least I do. Yeah, with a little bit of Mission Impossible thrown in because he has a team. But yes, it definitely feels like a uh, mocking of James Bond. And what Matthew Vaughn said is he needed an actor who could play 007, who should play 007, 
but he needed to hire them before they were playing 007 <laughs> to get him for this role. And so Henry Cavill was perfect. And I mean, Henry Cavill, he probably worked on this for what, two weeks, mostly in front of a green screen, maybe a couple days in Greece. <laughs> two weeks, two days, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, which, again, you, you might call that a delightful surprise, that you've been misled. I would call it a lie. <laughs> no, I was already told by the ads he was not the star. I did not come to this thinking this was going to be his Bond adventure, or at least that that was the focus. No, I didn't either. I knew this was going to be Sam Rockwell and Bryce Dallas Howard, and that Henry Cavill was going to be in these interludes as a fictional character. That was pretty clear from the trailer if not the billing order of the cast. And I thought, yeah, you would have these interludes constantly throughout, like showing what she was writing and compare it to what she was actually going through. And no, he's not in it that much. Yeah, and I don't know that I would want a whole movie of him doing this. It's not particularly funny, and maybe I'll be saying that a lot tonight, but I don't find anything funny about him taking Dua Lipa and swinging her around splay-legged. I feel like this movie thinks it's, hysterical that people are going to spin around. I don't get the joke. Yeah, what is the joke about Whirly Bird? I'm like, this is an attempt at humor. Someone thought this was funny, but I, it's going on too long. I'm just imagining smells as that crotches in your face. Like, there's nothing fun about this. And there's nothing particularly Bond about it. I mean, Bond doesn't dance, so I don't really... Again, it feels like a dorky 90s spoof of Bond. Austin Powers. Austin Powers was better than this. I don't know. I'm kind of enjoying this. Dua Lipa is doing fine in acting. I'm not going to want her in the entire movie, but I think she does fine. I like her music quite a bit. Dance the Night is my favorite song for Barbie. It wasn't one of the ones nominated for an Oscar, but hey, I'll listen to it all day long. And Levitating is a great song. Break My Heart. I'm a Dua Lipa fan. So I'm thinking she's doing fine as the Bond villainess here. And the chase? All right, let's debate this. Does Matthew Vaughn intentionally do bad CGI? Does he think it's funny to have bad CGI? Is this a artistic choice or a budgetary constraint that it looks so bad when Henry Cavill is jumping roof to roof on Santorini? It's so bad. I went to, it, it's not this bad, but it's pretty close to Sky Captain in the World Tomorrow, which is all shot in front of green screen and just looks awful. But th like, yeah, when he's in that car driving on a roof, this is public access quality. Well, here's what I would say. When we find out that this is just the fiction, silly fiction at that of a romance novelist is almost the way that Bryce Dallas Howard is going to come off, then I feel like, okay, you can make this look silly. What will shock me is that the quote-unquote real-world action will look no better or different than the stylized action. I guess that's my issue, because I knew this was like a story within a story, so maybe this is how they depict that, but when we're going to the real world, it doesn't look any better. It's a crummy-looking pseudo-bond, which, again, maybe that's the point. Maybe that is the joke, is that we're laughing at Mission Impossible-style stunts and what Tom Cruise would insist on doing himself on a roof on a motorcycle is now become this really gaudy looking chasing that just ends with John Cena pulling Dua Lipa off the bike and sitting her ass down. And John Cena, another actor who I just think brings good charisma to even bad movies. I think he's quite a bit of fun here. The way he just grabs her off the bike is a cool move, if not at all realistic. I mean, I saw it a hundred times in that trailer. That's my disappointment. John Cena, I'm like, oh, he's going to bring some levity, some humor. That's what he does. He's a surprisingly funny actor, and he never does anything, I think, to even attempt to make me laugh. Again, I would treat Cavill and him as cameos. They're doing this as a favor. This is not their movie, and it is supposed to be maybe a delightful surprise, but certainly a twist that they are the fantasy equivalents of people that look more ordinary, that they're going to look like Bryce Dallas Howard and Sam Rockwell is, again, supposed to be bringing some kind of realism to the spy genre. Everything we're seeing in this opening, we're going to find out actually did happen to Bryce Dallas Howard when she was Rachel Kyle. But in this moment, during the first viewing, all you experience it is, is, I think, a fairly silly spy adventure. You would not 
watch this and say, oh, wow, this is a credible John le Carre international adventure. It feels like pulp. And her fan base, the fact that she's so popular, it seems to be dime store trash novel, right? No one's calling this literature. No, but I think they were trying to make it seem like the Harry Potter thing, that she was releasing book four, that it was coming out with great fanfare, that they've made little figurines of the characters, that a lot of the people at the book reading have the flat top haircut, like they're trying to be Agent Argyle. It seemed like that was a hardcore, devoted fan base, which made me wonder, if this is the launch of her book, why is her reading of the final chapter telling everybody how the book ends. <laughs> I'd be so mad if like, I went to a book reading and yes, a book I haven't read just got spoiled. <laughs> Even by the author, that would be irritating. But yes, what kind of author generates this level of fandom where like people cosplay and... J.K. Rowling, Stephanie Myers In the spy genre? I went to Stephanie Meyer, but I thought, look, I'm... I'm out of the literary scene, but I, I had the same thought when I was watching American fiction last year. I'm like, do people read anymore? Are there even bookstores to have readings? Who cares this much about books? Does Twilight, Harry Potter, those are over a decade old. Is there a big YA series that everyone's lining up to buy these days? I mean, I think probably yes, Jacob. I will, I will be hopeful and say there are still literate people that care about books. I know I still read when I'm not <laughs> reading for now playing. Which is almost never. Are you going to be reading Argyle, though? <laughs> right. But the guy, the idea that it has action figures without a movie tie-in, all of this feels very strange to me. It doesn't feel like they're satirizing anything that I understand about the world today. Yeah, I would have gone with the conceits a little more if Henry Cavill and John Cena were playing Henry Cavill and John Cena in the Argyle movie adaptation. And we were seeing scenes from the Argyle movie because if this book sold so fast, and book one came out five years earlier, or four years earlier at the very least, they had time to take a hit book and turn that into a movie by then. I think it was around book four, book five, that the Harry Potter films started coming out. And why are we to imagine that they are so popular? Because again, there's lots of spy series, and none of them have this level of frenetic cosplaying fandom. Is it because she does predict real world events before they happen that is my takeaway because that's all they draw attention to is like she oh she's predicted so many things so like let's read these books she obviously knows her stuff yeah i mean we'd have to think that these books have a sense of realism that no other spy novel would have ever had i mean she's like tom clancy and yet it has no realism when we've seen this opening scene yes <laughs> which is the disconnect that i'm having if you're telling me she's Stephanie Meyer, then I imagine that this is YA romantic fiction masquerading in a spy suit. But what she is going to say is, and the way they're going to frame her character is, she knows nothing about love and romance. She only does research-heavy, hard-fact, predict-the-future kinds of stories. And, you know, a guy is going to ask her out here at this book reading, and she's going to say, I've got a hot date. And, of course, the surprise is... It's with that stupid cat. She's, yeah, terrible at love. She's all by herself. She's a workaholic. And, you know, this is Romancing the Stone, right? I'm trying to think of a movie equivalent. There was a film by Robert Zemeckis in the 80s about a romance novelist who got caught up in her own kind of adventure, kind of an Indiana Jones thing. Yeah, it's a fun movie. I don't really remember. I mean, I'd have to go back to it. But I guess that's what they're going for here. That's what you would be thinking about is that she's going to be caught up in one of her own spy plots. You don't predict, Arnie, that she can predict what's happening because she is the spy. No, I didn't think she was the spy. I thought, very much I thought, romancing the stone to the point that Jason, our associate producer, and I were spitballing a Romancing the Stone, Jewel of the Nile, Argyle retrospective series <laughs> with the three movies in a row. And I definitely thought that she was just going to be the novelist swept up in the adventure. And maybe you see a Kingsman tie here. I noticed that she does make a cocktail for herself with what looks like Statesman whiskey. There is definitely a Statesman logo on a can 
that she's drinking in London later on. So Statesman is peppered throughout this film. Right. That was, if you recall from the second movie, the whiskey distillery was the front for the American spy operation. Bourbon, thank you. You don't get bourbon confused with whiskey. Yeah, but <laughs> later on when we go to a vineyard, I'm like, oh, this is like, yeah, the whiskey and bourbon and all that stuff that was going on in those Kingsmen. Is this the tie? Because I know there's some tie in this film, and so I'm always looking for it. Right. So this is it. Yes, she is a lonely, broken heart, and that kind of sets this up as a romance story. You would expect her to fall in love as she's going to get swept up in this adventure. And the conflict here at the beginning is she thinks she's written a great book and mom stays up all night to read it and comes back and says, you don't have a satisfying conclusion. We need an ending. Does that make you suspect Catherine O'Hara? Because that put me on edge with her, that, that she's so heavily involved with these spy books and wants to rewrite it and come up with something else. Yes, I predicted instantly that she was in on it. So did I, because of that. I was way ahead of this movie. I was not ahead of this movie. Catherine O'Hara played the mom in Home Alone. She plays a mom here. I just chalked her up to the mother role. I think we saw her in the trailer as the mother. And her wanting another chapter, I didn't think of it as being part of the spy agency at all. But I did the plot summary. We know all the spoilers. That she is the head of the PsyOps division. She wants the other chapter because what they're leading up to is getting this master file. And Ellie is about to write the next chapter, which explains how Argyle would get this master file, which is what the division needs to know because the division wants the master file. And so that's why Mom Ruth is prodding Ellie to write the next chapter and not wait for the next book is this is what the division wants to know. And Ruth convinces Ellie of this. So if the division has such control over Ellie, why would they do the next thing they do and start sending people to attack Ellie? This makes no sense to me. Okay, this was a big question for me. Is it because Sam Rockwell shows up? Because I assume they're always having people tail her and watch her, so there's always people around. My only guess is because Sam Rockwell shows up, and so they gotta move in and do a fight. Otherwise, it makes no sense why they'd move in at this point. Yeah, I really had to think about this because I'm like, why would they kill her? But I believe all the bullets are intended for him. They have a pin. Someone pretends to want her autograph and it's a needle. I just predict that that's a knockout drug. To put her to sleep, yes. Yeah, they wouldn't actually kill her. They want to take her away from this deadly... Because again, if she's writing the story about how a hero gets a file on all the bad guys, if you're the bad guys... You want to stop the hero. So we are to understand, and very helpfully, when Sam Rockwell plops into this movie, every other scene, he's glitching and turning into Henry Cavill. We will understand he has some kind of connection to the spy in the story. Now, again, I didn't see the twist in this coming, but because she closes her eyes, opens them, sees Henry Cavill, closes her eyes, opens them, and sees Sam Rockwell... I legitimately thought either A, she's insane, B, this is just her imaginings as she's writing book five or book six, or C, and I know my mind's off the reservation with this one, Henry Cavill is a ghost. Wow. Like a ghost? <laughs> like the sixth sense. Possessing Sam Rockwell? Yes. Okay. To me, it's really obvious. Like, I saw Long <laughs> Kiss Goodnight. I saw... These movies where it's all about the suburban housewife that ends up being the spy. La Femme Nikita, spy. Melissa McCarthy made this movie. I feel like it's a predictable formula. Frankly, the idea of taking someone out of suburban life and thrusting them into this kind of situation, it seemed really obvious that if she knows these things she shouldn't know, she has an identity that is just lying under the surface, in her subconscious. And yes, Henry Cavill is both her and Sam Rockwell. I think that's where the story gets kind of messy. It wants to imply that it's together, the two of them, that makes the spy team. Well, Sam Rockwell's actually John Cena. <laughs> well, 
later, but not in these scenes. No, not in these scenes, but I do want to take a second just to praise Sam Rockwell. Anything positive I have to say is probably going to be about Sam Rockwell. Like when he shows up and he's like, a cat should be in a hat, not in a backpack. I don't know. It's the way he delivers stuff. If any jokes are going to land with me in this, it's because of Sam Rockwell. Sam Rockwell is a national treasure. I have never seen him give a bad performance. I've seen him be in bad films, but he always elevates the films he's in. Even the original Charlie's Angels with Drew Barrymore, go back to that review. He's amazing in that film, and he doesn't have to be. He's better than the material allows him to be, and he is good here. I think the script has given him good lines, and I think he delivers them well. I just love it when he's here with the scraggly beard. I've never seen him with such a beard before, kicking his feet up on the tray and reading the Argyle book, pretending to not know who Ellie is sitting across from him. He's just, yeah, he is great in this entire movie. You say if you have positive things to say, it's about him. I have positive things to say about other things, but my strongest positives are about him. Sure, I like Sam Rockwell, but this is, what's interesting about this is we're talking about spies, 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 but everything that we saw with Ellie unable to write her story, you know, she has a moment where she, mom says the ending needs work, she tries it on her own and it turns into a really cheesy love scene. Do you buy them as a couple? We will really understand this story as a meet cute in which these two fall in love again or... She learns to love him. You know, at first she's repelled by he's kind of a, you know, long-haired freak. But do you think that he has good chemistry with Bryce Dallas Howard? I do not feel like they're a couple I want to follow. I'm just going to say I'm not a Bryce Dallas Howard fan. I don't think many have chemistry with her. And yeah, that's a problem. I never buy them as a couple in this. I don't know why he's so into her because he's like really head over heels for her in this and I don't know why. Yeah, Sam Rockwell really lays that on heavy to the point that I wonder if that was a good choice because I don't love her. I buy their relationship later in the movie. I completely go with it. I mean, again, Sam Rockwell is able to sell me a used car. He can sell me on this relationship. He can sell me anything. And Bryce Dallas Howard I'm not not a fan of hers. I'm pretty indifferent to her overall in those Jurassic World films. You can listen to those reviews. She neither made nor broke those films. They did that on their own. I won't blame her for the Shyamalans. Yeah. (laughs) And so here, I think she's perfectly fine as Ellie. I don't have problems with her. And I think these two, chemistry is a strong word to use, but they work okay together. Yeah, but they're, like, in love. Right. Supposedly. I really want to stress that this does not work as a spy thing. It is mocking spy things. And I don't think you really follow what's going on or even care about how they find the file or what's in the file or any of that nonsense really doesn't... That just washes right over you. This is about two people falling in love. And I don't think this movie has it with these two. I'm just going to go ahead and say this is the beginnings of the problems because we're supposed to love that he's getting under her skin, and then slowly but surely, he's going to teach her to be her old, cool self again. But you say this is mocking spy films, but this battle on the train is actually good Matthew Vaughn action. I would put it up there with some of the weaker moments of the church scene from Kingsman, which is one of my favorite action scenes of all time. But Sam Rockwell flipping people, the way they cut, so seamlessly between Henry Cavill doing it and Sam Rockwell doing it. The fact that this is scored to the song Do You Want to Funk With Me, which I only know from Trading Places, Eddie Murphy's party in that movie, but I was flashing back to Trading Places as this song was thumping on my subwoofers. This is a good, solid action scene, I think. No, I agree. I'm more or less into this action scene. I think they cut back and forth between Rockwell and Cavill a little too much. I get the point, but subtlety is not this film's strong suit. But yeah, I'm into this action scene. If the film could be this, it's probably going to be a recommend. Yeah, it's all right. And I'm trying to remember my first viewing, because again, this is a second time watch. The first time I was in the IMAX four months ago, and I think, yeah, I was more or less following the movie, but already ahead of it in many ways, predicting things that would come to be, and again, who cares whether you figure twists out or not if you like watching 
the chemistry of the players. And one thing I just, I knew then and now was that these two don't have it, whatever you want to call it, the good screen pairings of screwball comedy. They're not funny. Again, I can like Sam Rockwell and say that I don't find him particularly funny in this movie. I don't think she's funny. I don't think they do that much that's funny in this movie. I never laugh at anyone except Sam Rockwell a few times. Yeah, the lines. It's Bear Hug O'Clock. It's really not a very funny movie, and that's too bad. And I put a lot of that on this script. But it's a film with levity. I can't say I ever laugh at any of the lines, but the whole thing has a fun vibe to it. And that counts for a lot. I don't take what he's saying seriously. No, I don't laugh at its bear hug o'clock, but I just enjoy the physical humor of the fight that he goes through. I feel like I've seen Matthew Vaughn do this all before better. And while this scene was okay, it wasn't great. And very soon we're, yes, let's get to it. So they escape through a parachute and he has a lot of scenes of trying to encourage this woman to get over her fears. She has a lot of inhibitions. She's never been on a plane before. She's never been to London before. She doesn't know that she can follow this crazy guy and and break the rules the way that she's going to. But she basically learns she can't go home because they've ransacked her place. And she does believe that people at this point are trying to kill her. There is this division that very much like in her books, is trying to hunt her down. Yeah, I don't think we needed the whole fear of flying characteristic. I don't think Bryce Dallas Howard sells it well, tapping herself on the forehead a lot. And I don't think it ever goes anywhere because, yeah, Sam Rockwell calms her down pretty quickly and it never comes up again. No, no, that's them falling in love, Arnie. That's what I'm talking about. He is teaching her how to love who she used to be. And through that, they're going to be great secret agents slash great lovers. That's the story that we're going to find out that this is about. And you better like them doing this stuff. Because I was looking for twists everywhere, I did think he's telling this story about climbing some mountain. He gets the name wrong. She corrects it. I'm like, oh, that means he's lying because he's making all this up to trick her or something. But no, I, I guess, again, that's to show that subconsciously she was there too. And so she knows all about it, knows how to pronounce it. So just to revisit the last time we saw Henry Cavill inside her story, he was in Hong Kong. He had paid gold bars to get a key to something in London. And that means that's why they have to go to London. That because everything she writes has some truth to it, they need to follow that and find what they believe to be a master file. That there is a hacker that was going to deal with this. We'll find out with Argyle, but we don't know that part of yet. But there's a hacker in London who wanted to give up a list of bad guy names on a thumb drive, and that leads them to this Alfred monument. And this scene, I think, is one of Bryce Dallas Howard's shining moments where she starts imagining what she would write and walking through the scene and sitting down with the laptop and not just a laptop it's a mac everything (laughs) good is apple in this true but but this movie was made before apple financed it so coincidence i don't know pick up shots (laughs) yeah (laughs) maybe it's a cgi laptop maybe it was a microsoft (laughs) surface and they spent some of that 200 million making it a macbook but i like her scene of deducing what she would write and what happened next and finding the satellite dishes and coming up with the locations. I wish there was more of her deducing stuff in this movie and less of her trying to look astonished. Yeah, I thought there was going to be a lot of stuff. Oh, let me go through my research and my books and oh, it reveals this and it reveals that. And you get it in basically a scene, maybe a little bit later, there's a couple more references, but it's not her thing. I can't really follow it. I don't know how they find the anarchist stuff. (laughs) Right, yeah. Like, they just end up in a building in a room, and I'll go, okay. And it's it's underneath the floor for reasons. Sam Rockwell has to dance. He dances in so many of his films. He comes up with a reason to dance here, and that reveals there's a hollow spot on the floor. I mean, I think clue-solving is fun stuff when you are invested in it. And this stuff feels just kind of perfunctory. All of a sudden, she's just decided they're in this room. At least that's how it feels like to me. 
They have a notebook that's important. They have a boat key. And now a bunch of goons are coming there to kill them. And we have another Matthew Vaughn acrobatic action scene set to disco. Yeah, most of the action scenes are set to songs, not score. And that really works. I will get tired of the fight scenes by the end of this movie. But for this one in the hallway, I am still going with it. I like it when Sam Rockwell's trying to convince Bryce Dallas Howard to follow him and crush all the heads and, you know, do the twist and stomp and, like, crushing a melon. I thought that was a fun moment between them. I'm not laughing. I'll be honest. I feel it's a little labored. You'd say that this thing is infused with fun. I feel like they got a lead balloon. And I see a lot of people huffing and puffing and trying to put some air in this thing. But it's not light and funny like the Kingsman scenes. It's feeling more like Kingsman 2 and 3 than Kingsman. I really feel like Sam Rockwell is doing his damnedest to, like, entertain the audience, but, like, nothing else is working. Like, he's trying to make these lines work. He's, yeah, like, when he says, you know, twist and stomp and all that, like, he's funny doing it, but not Bryce Dallas Howard. Again, I'm not gonna, I mean, she has to be the straight man to his craziness, but, yeah, I just, I'm not enjoying them together. I won't say it again, but I just don't think that they have a lot of fun doing this. I don't see a lot of screwballiness that I enjoy in these moments of him basically encouraging her to be the badass that we know she's going to be once we know who she really is. And during this scene, they got to jump off that roof. This is where you get that dumb cat CGI animation that I thought was going to be throughout this film. Thankfully, it is not. (laughs) No, but this is important because this is the real world. This is not one of her books. And they have a scene where they're up on the roof and jump. And Arnie, I really want to know, and I mean this from the heart, you are really hard at movie effects. Of all the hosts, you are the most critical when a shot looks bad. So how are you processing this, they jump down and the cat pops up? I take it like the movie Garfield with Bill Murray doing the voice. Okay, we're in a bad place now. (laughs) Yeah, do you take the movie Garfield? Because I wouldn't pick that up. If you're going for a comedic effect, I can go with this. It takes me back to my question earlier. Is this bad CGI on purpose? Is this bad CGI to be funny? And because they're going for comedy, I'm not as hard on it. Are you laughing? Yeah, are you laughing? A little bit at the cat's facial expressions. I mean, more than anything... I'm wondering how they didn't land on the cat when they did their fall off the roof. (laughs) I was wondering that too. (laughs) I mean, I just, I don't, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a real problem. Like this moment is where I start to really tire of these action pieces. And this movie's really long. I just want to emphasize, we're going to get so much more of this. And I don't feel like there's a single action scene in this movie that equals anything we saw in The Kingsman. You compare it to The Church, that thing was laced with menace. That thing was a shocker. And there is no shock in this movie. I thought we were going to get that. I didn't realize this was PG-13 when I put it on. So I kept waiting. When are we going to get the church scene? Matthew Vaughn's got to do it. And I think he tries later and it does not land. It will be shocking, but not for the (laughs) reasons he thinks it is. But for the way that it's been neutered by PG-13. But yes, hold all thoughts about the infights. My point is, it's really at this moment that this movie is starting to have problems. For me, I'm recognizing... I don't really like this movie. Yeah, I've had trouble figuring all the clues out. How did they get here? And if I was laughing, if I was won over by the action, that wouldn't be as much of an issue. But when I'm bored, when it's not working, that's when I get into the logistics. And I don't really understand how they know to go from place to place. I'm still having fun with it and rolling with it, especially on my first watching. Actually, even more so on my second watching. I was a little easier on this film on a second viewing than I was on a first. And I want to know where it's going to go and where it goes is to a hotel. And Aiden says on the phone that he's wants to put a bullet in Ellie's head. And I'm like, wow, I did not see that twist coming at all. I thought he was going to be the good guy for the film and he's a double agent. But you know, he's a good guy, right? I mean, yes, this is like she overheard something and out of context. It sounds really threatening, but you know that he is a good guy. This is not a turn where you believe he actually wants to kill her. 
I wasn't sure the first time I saw it. Yeah, this is the only time I've seen it, and because he, like, messed up that name in the beginning, and then this scene, I'm like, oh, maybe there's gonna be some double-crossing going on with him. All right, I, I never believe him as a threat. And, I mean, I think that this goes away. This is just so she can run to a phone booth and call mom, and we can get the big twist. We have had a lot of her understanding that there are people out to get her, and we've cut away to Brian Cranston, but she has no way of knowing that Brian Cranston's character, to her, when she sees him, that's dead. But to the audience, by this point in the movie, when they're coming together at the Savoy Hotel, what are we, about an hour into the film, that Brian Cranston is the bad guy. She should not be hugging him. Yeah, that was a huge shock for me. When the door opens and it's Brian Cranston, I'm like, oh my god, the head of the division is there, we've seen him ruthlessly kill his underlings, and then when she calls him dad, my mind was blown the first time. I was, I was like, what the hell is going on? I wouldn't say my mind was blown because I suspected Catherine O'Hara as being bad, so when he walked in, I'm like, okay, confirm, she's bad too, they're all in on it. But I'm like, okay, I, didn't, I wouldn't have guessed Brian Cranston was her dad, quote-unquote. No, yeah, but I mean, I'm not, it doesn't blow my mind. It's not like I thought he was a good guy or her dad. I thought, you know, obviously, yes, he's a bad guy, and they're going to play with that for a little bit, and this is what's going to bring her back to Aiden, to Sam Rockwell, is that he'll come and save her from the scenario. Mom will actually pull a gun on her, and that confirms that she can't really trust anyone except on instinct, and there's just something about Aiden that makes her feel safer than anybody else. I'm so mad at Aiden when he shows up. He shoots Catherine O'Hara. I'm like, okay, she's dead, I guess. But then they just run out. I'm like, no, shoot Ritter. Shoot Brian Cranston's character. Like, he's the main bad guy. Why don't you just shoot him? You have a gun. Why just knock him out? Yeah, there's no other goons there. It'd be one thing if they had the SWAT teams, but it seems like they should be able to handle, question these two. Yeah, don't let them. I mean, again, if you're trying to bring down the directorate, ice them, right? I mean, hate to be that callous, but it's not that kind of movie. But it seems like you could have made that choice. But this is about her journey. I mean, I think this is when we understand she leaves the cat behind and she loses one Alfie and gains another Alfie because she's going to wind up at a vineyard owned by Sam Jackson, who is playing Alfred, the former head of the CIA. This is where we are really going to learn a lot of things about who she was. So much exposition. I like It goes on so long. Yeah, it's heavy. I'm a Sam Jackson fan. I usually like him in films, Long Kiss, Good Night Notwithstanding. And here, his appearance is actually where I start to turn on this film, because this scene is laborious. And then this is where the twist is revealed. Ellie is Rachel Kyle, former super spy, the finest CIA operative ever trained, trained by Alfie, recruited by the division because the division used to be a good organization until it went rogue under brian cranston and so now the secret is out our kyle argyle and i'm like i don't think i like that twist <laughs> that she's actually an agent because i i it blew me away like the cover story she was in this accident and she was told it was a skating accident now if you have donated to listen to our shane black series i'm like is this a Long Kiss Goodnight reference? Like, is this a riff? I mean, obviously it's a riff. The ordinary woman is actually a spy, but like to go directly to a sk- ice skating accident. Wow. To take what you're saying and, and rephrase it, I think is, does this movie, it knows it's ripping off Shane Black or is it subconsciously yeah. ripping off Shane Black <laughs> is the true question. But either way you slice it, I've been suspecting this was Long Kiss Goodnight and now it has become that. I just think Bryce Dallas Howard does not play a spy as well as she plays an author. The rest of this movie, as she is going to become a spy, I'm going to turn on this movie. I never buy her as a spy. No, I don't either. I have been very positive about the movie thus far. The first half of this movie was something I really enjoyed. But once the secret is out and Bryce Dallas Howard has to change her performance to be Rachel Kyle, it starts to... A, go on too long. Like you said, Stuart, this is a two and a half hour movie. It does not need to be. And B, it's not fun when she is poorly performing as a spy. Yeah, it's a tricky role. And again, thinking in terms of Gina Davis, 
who was, what, a school teacher who found out she was an assassin. I feel like Gina navigated both worlds. Now, I had my problems with that movie, but I felt like she was able to show a believable comedic interpretation of both sides of her character. Whereas I definitely think you're right. Bryce Dallas Howard seems out of her element the further she's asked to go. Now, it kind of works for the comedy. If you're watching this as a comedy, how is this mousy author going to be able to pull a gun and do all this? Will this be about Aiden retraining her how to do it all? They should do a shorthand. Basically, he is the calming presence. They have a love affair. And when he puts her in a good mood, she is able to just pull it from sense memory. He can insult her and she can suddenly punch him and have him on the ground. Our Kyle is still inside of her, but she just has to get past a whole lot of anxiety and inhibitions laid on by the Brian Cranston and Catherine O'Hara characters, right? They made her fearful. They wanted her to be afraid and inoperable. And why did they do that? Because when she had her accident, the division thought she was a division double agent, that she was working for the division. So why didn't they just restore her real memories where she'd be a division agent? Why did they do all of this, hey, you're a normal girl who had a skating accident and now start writing us books? Right, and why would you want someone suddenly to become world famous and recognizable by everyone and telling all of your secrets. That seems like you would not allow her to have this author identity. She'd have to get away from them, out of their control, and do that against their wishes, I would think. This doesn't make any sense to me why they would do this to what they believe to be one of their own operatives. Agreed. So, again, plausible? No. But if this is rom-com, if this is romancing the stone, well, maybe you just roll with it. Maybe you just say it's part of the fun watching the performer go against type. Is it fun to watch mousy Bryce Dallas Howard in these next few moments find her inner killer? She has to go to Arabia for convoluted reasons. The file is being held by some other woman. Why isn't it in London? Because the anarchist hacker sent it there, I think. It doesn't make any sense why the hacker wouldn't just hand the thumb drive to Bryce Dallas Howard. Let's spell this out for people who haven't seen the film. The real accident that happened to Ellie wasn't a skating accident. She went to see the hacker to get the file. The hacker said, I gave the file to the secret keeper, Saba al-Badir in the Arabian Peninsula. And so... Ellie, or R. Kyle, kills the hacker, which sets off explosions. He had his pulse rigged to a detonator. She has to jump out a window, and that's what really caused her amnesia. She remembers all of this, and now knows they have to go to Saba al-Badir, played by Sophia Butella, I think is how it's pronounced, who was the razor blade leg girl in Kingsman. And, unfortunately, the other mummy in that Tom Cruise movie. So, they have to go there to get the thumb drive from her. And Sam Rockwell made a point earlier of saying, Spies, you got them mostly correct, but they're not like you describe. They don't have bespoke suits and dress so well. And yet, Sam Jackson's going to say, If you can't remember the reality, I suggest you both dress like the fantasy. So we're going to see Sam Rockwell here in an Argyle-like suit and Bryce Dallas Howard in a shimmering gold dress. And they're dancing to their song. Now, we're going to find out they have a long history together, going back maybe a decade or more. But their song is the Beatles' Now and Then. I don't know much about the Beatles, but I know that song just came out in like 2023. That's a new Beatles song. I don't know how that's their song when it just came out. Not only that... But guess who put that all together? Apple? Apple! Yes! Can you imagine? This is, I'm telling you, pick up shots. Yeah, to add all this stuff in. That's how they got to 200 million. I watched the documentary. Apple is very proud that they found a way to reunite the Beatles. They're all playing on this song. And yes, it came out five months ago. 
So there is no reason why this would be a couple song for decades on end. But by it or not, this is the song that they're playing in this moment. It just takes me out because, again, I'm seeing so much Apple self-promotion in all of this. But pretty soon, we're getting to the biggest twist of all, perhaps. Although, if you've seen Total Recall, not that shocking. (laughs) Rachel Kyle is one of the bad guys. She will have this scene with the Keeper and read through the file and find out that she was among them or not. Help me out with, there's so many twists here. Is she a bad guy that has turned good because Ellie Kyle is going to bring her to the good side? Or is she always playing the other side and we're supposed to know that she never was really bad, but was still on this list? She never was really bad. Yes. And why, why would that be? And why is that interesting? She was never really bad, I take it, because A, we want to like this character, and B, because of her love for Sam Rockwell. So her whole thing was to pretend to be a division agent until she got the file, and then she was going to deliver that master file to Alfie all along. But she did kill that guy for it. Yes. She's a spy, she killed a lot of people, and she was pretending to work for the division, so needed to kill him. Yeah, he wasn't a bad guy. She killed a player in the game that didn't necessarily ask for it. So I don't think that we see her as an innocent. And again, think about Total Recall. Arnold is revealed to be the villain as well as the hero. You could have played with that. You could have had the idea that, yes, in a former identity, before she had lived the life of an everyday person who wanted love, she was cold and calculating. But now that she's fallen in love with Sam Rockwell, maybe for the first time, you could actually play it that way, that she never loved him in the previous identity, but now does. There just seems to be better ways of playing it than this confusing line that I think gets said at the end of, like, I was never going to betray you. All right. There are more interesting ways to play it. And by the same token, this movie is semi-confusing. Semi. And not very clear in character motivations. And so I almost don't want them to try to deepen it because I just feel it would muddle it even more. Right. What they need to deepen is our feelings about these two. And by this point, she's coming back. And how are we supposed to feel if we know that she's one of the bad guys? That's what gets revealed here. Catherine O'Hara blows back in and gets that confession out of her. She relives the moment of executing the hacker and then they all pass out from drug tea, she's going to wake up playing Rachel to the hilt. She is going to be villainous. Do you guys buy this? Are you surprised by the twist that she turns back? No. This is an act. It's obvious. Here's the thing is, I don't buy it, but yet I kind of do, because I don't know what Matthew Vaughn's kind of ride he'll take me on, but Bryce Dallas Howard is at her worst playing evil. I don't buy it because she doesn't sell me on it because she is truly bad at trying to be a evil super spy. Her scene where she shoots Sam Rockwell, I don't take her as evil, cold-hearted, etc. Yeah, we don't believe that scene, but maybe you would never believe that scene. Maybe because you know that this is a love story. I don't know. It would be awfully daring of Matthew Vaughn to sell us a love story, and at this point say, no, actually, she'd kill him to get what she needs. But then what's the rest of the movie? Samuel L. Jackson has to come in to stop her? Again, I don't even know. But yeah, I never suspect that I'm in that movie. I always know that he never would betray her, and that's why his confession earlier that he wants to kill Ellie Conway, all he was referring to, as it turns out, is he wants this sanitized identity wiped away so he can have the girl he loved again and yeah i don't know how they're going to write it but i know when she shoots him he's not dead i mean the fact that they bring up this mysterious fan mail earlier in the opening scene they had another agent kira who got shot and someone's like oh here's a way you could bring her back i'm like well she was shot like in the heart and then she shoots him in the heart i already knew kira wrote that fan email and she's still alive i'm like they're gonna have some really stupid explanation to wipe this bullet shot away in the heart, and boy, do they. Yeah, I tried Googling this. They talk about the vascular corridor, where if you shoot a bullet just at the right angle, it'll go through, and you will survive a shot to the heart as long as you stop the bleeding. And 
there is something called a vascular corridor. I couldn't find anything about people being shot in it and living. I don't care if this is true. I still don't believe it. Yeah, I mean, and again, it's not about realism at this point. I don't feel like this is a movie treading heavily on fact and research. <laughs> Whatever Ellie Conway <laughs> wants to say, I'm not buying that she even does do hard research. What I'm wondering is, okay, so yes, for contrived reasons, she really saved his life after she shot him by plugging the hole or whatever. And they're going to reunite. And this is really, I think I've been struggling with the movie. And this is really where I turn hard on this movie. Okay, I'm on the same page with you because, oh boy, <laughs> here we go. Yeah, it's already feeling really long. Like, I really want this movie to be over. Comedy should not be over two hours. At this point, we're dragging past the two-hour mark. or getting close to there. She wants to prove that she's Rachel Kyle, badass, Argyle. And so they give her these two scenes that are just, one's worse than the next. But yeah, the first one is this smirking, we're emerging from the armory, blowing everyone away in clouds of purple hearts. Awful. It could work. The stylization could work. Matthew Vaughn did the joke about the people's heads exploding off in the original Kingsman. That was funny. Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey when she's attacking the cops and it goes into all this colorful fireworks. That worked. This, I'm trying to figure out why. Like, it goes on too long. It's too much. This does not work. I hate this scene so much. I don't hate this scene, but I don't like this scene. It does remind me of the head explosions, which were very colorful from Kingsman. But that was one of the things I didn't like about Kingsman. I felt like that was too silly for that movie. And that's saying a lot for that movie. It's honestly my least favorite scene in Kingsman. And this was taking me back to it. But I kind of go with this because this is a fantasy in their head. It's not really happening this way. It's almost like a musical. No, this is supposed to be real. I think because sometimes we see external perspectives. Brian Cranston is watching this on a monitor and they're not doing these flips, dance moves kinds of things that we see when we're in their perspective. Then shouldn't it be Henry Cavill and John Cena? Okay, I want to bring that up because they should have kissed. Like, yeah, if those are the analogs for these two and they're in this romance, I just think the movie should have gone there. Oh, definitely at the end. I was definitely surprised that they didn't make that joke, but save that because we need to really talk about the worst scene in this film, the one that does try to relive the church. I mean, I feel like this is Matthew Vaughn doing what he's best at, but on a PG-13 rating with these actors and these effects, the oil slick ice skating. And again, I'm thinking... Yeah, Gina Davis did so much better. Go listen to our Longest Goodnight review, even though I was laughing through that one. I am not laughing in this one. And this this is a PG-13 film, so I cannot say the F word, but F this scene. Like, this made me, I was kind of like, oh, this is a, kind of a dumb movie, but this made me really hate this film. Let's explain to people who haven't seen this movie what we're talking about. In the shootout with all the goons, including Carlos, the head assassin, they go into the heart of this oil tanker and bullets start allowing crude oil to spill out all over the floor. This creates a conundrum because the bad guys and good guys can't use their guns anymore because it could spark a fire and so they go to knives. But because the oil is so slippery and they're all wearing dress shoes, the bad guys can't really make it across the oil. They're going pretty slow. And so Ellie takes two knives stomps on them with the boots that she got out of the armory, their army boots, and proceeds to ice skate on crude oil, which you can't do. It's only like a quarter inch of crude oil with cement underneath. Aren't those knives just like rubbing against the ground? Like she would just trip and fall. It's just how it looks. It's not even that it's impractical. Bugs Bunny did it. I'd buy it. But in this, <laughs> it looks like absolute hot garbage. And then when she's spinning around, they get the guns out anyway. And then she shoots the guns that they couldn't shoot. <laughs> In the end, they're still using the firearms and she's spinning so fast that I, again, I hear you dismissing this as fantasy, but I haven't been told that. This is really happening. I believe this is real. I believe the hearts in the smoke were fantasy. I believe this is really happening. And 
it doesn't look terrible. I like it when the camera is spinning around as Ellie and Carlos are in their final battle and some of the slow-mo of Ellie doing the leap. But the whole idea is so implausible and the whole scene is just not well done. It's okay, but not really well done. They could just cut it, right? Nobody even cared who Carlos was. You could just cut this scene from this overlong movie and save yourself the pain of it. And it would be a much, much, much better movie. I can honestly tell you, at least a half star would be added to the rating. Yeah, it's a bad scene. It does not do Ellie justice. It does not make her look like a badass. And worst, this bugged the shit out of me on a second viewing. One of her moves, she dives to her knees and is sliding across the oil on her knees. And then she stands back up. Her legs are clean. There's a little black oil on the bottom hem of her dress, but her legs are clean. Maybe one knee a little later on has some dirt on it, but her entire legs would be blackened. And for the rest of the movie, they're clean. And that that really bugged me on my second viewing. I can't even say. And Arnie, they're clean because these are bad effects and she's not really there. And that's how you know that is because... This is this blue screen nightmare. This is, it's so awful. But then they go to the server room because the whole point is she's trying to upload this file of evil agents to Sam Jackson and they've got to bypass something. It keeps becoming a thing. This is the cat's moment. If you've been wondering why they've needed to have this stupid cat and so much of this movie, it's so that it can kill Brian Cranston in the server room. Not just kill him, but also scratch his eye so they can't do a retinal scan. So again, just more time wasting because now we got to go figure it out another way. It's just scene after scene where nothing gets solved. I don't watch this movie, so I don't really know. But I suspect if I watched Adam Sandler movies, they would feel like this. This is starting <laughs> to feel like an Adam Sandler movie, like a spy movie. If he made spy movies, it would feel stupid like this, which is really shocking because I didn't think of Matthew Vaughn making stupid things. Sure, I didn't like everything that he's made, but this is really bad stuff. Really bad comedy. I'll agree that the cat coming out and attacking Brian Cranston is a stupid scene. I don't know if it's Adam Sandler's level stupid, especially the stuff Adam Sandler's been doing the past decade, but it's bad. Brian Cranston, we haven't really discussed him. He's another actor who I think is good in just about everything, and I think he's good here, but not given enough to do. He chews up the scenery as the main bad guy, and he's taken out way too easily by the cat. How did the cat kill him? Scratched his eyes till he died. The joke is it's a retinal scan. So now, don't worry, we still have another way, and we'll go up, and now we'll fight Catherine O'Hara. And Sam Jackson is watching, what, a Lakers game? I love this, because I feel like that's what Sam Jackson was really doing between takes, and they just filmed him. I wish I was watching a Lakers game during this. But wasn't that his thing in Kingsman? That, like, he had Lakers hat? I kept waiting for this to be the tie. I thought, like, he's going to use that master... Maybe he does go on after this to become bad with that master file. Like, if you look in the background, he has, like, a map of the world with all these arrows pointing all over the place. You're trying too hard. No, he is not the same character. There's no way. Evil twin, then. Kingsman was his evil twin. It, there's got to be some connection. The same connection is that they wanted Sam Jackson because he's a lovable actor and was free to do this but didn't really want to try that hard and yeah this ending it feels like a you know the mind control thing was the ending of Kingsman and so now we're going to do it on a much smaller scale with Ellie turning into Rachel trying to kill her boyfriend because of a music box because of the Beatles yeah this does go on too long and the way it ends that Kira who we never even knew was a real person Comes out of nowhere and smacks Catherine O'Hara on the head with a wrench. I had been waiting for her. She was the secret fan that sent that email. I knew that. I was waiting for her to show up again. So you feel this was well set up and pays off? No, I don't think anything is well set up and pays off in this. No, I'm going to go with Arnie. I wasn't even thinking about Kira, so I wasn't waiting for this joke to be real. They drew so much attention to that. Like, I just, I, I thought she was going to be the one that gave her the file that ended up being that other woman. They didn't give her that much attention. It was a line dropped. And I don't, I mean, again, Ariana DeBose is an Oscar-winning actress from three years ago, West Side Story. You would think she'd have a better part here. But she's basically 
filler, just like Cena and Cavill. And they come back here for the end. This is where they should kiss, right? If Ellie and Sam Rockwell are making out... It's 2024. I feel like John Cena, he showed up naked at the Oscars, and Henry Cavill seems funny, like they would have kissed. I agree. This had to be a choice from on a high. They were game. They may have even shot it. And then someone at the studio says, we can't. You know, I don't think Ellie would have put that in her book. And so I don't think they should have done it. If Ellie and Aiden are Cena and Cavill, and they love each other, then those two characters need to love each other. Yeah, it would just be about the sight gag of cutting from Rockwell and Howard to them doing the same thing. Because that's what they do anyway. Except it's awkward because they're not looking at each other. It's not like the joke would have saved the movie. It's just something I thought they they were going to do. And instead, again, if this was a rom-com about them doing fireworks, remember that scene she was trying to write? She said it was horrible because they have the fireworks in the background and it was so cheesy. Is this scene any less cheesy? Is it even supposed to be less cheesy? Or is it supposed to say that that scene mirrors the reality more than she wanted to admit. I see no difference between reality and fiction in this film. It all looks like bad CGI. At this point, I can't even tell whether she's a good author or not, but it is good that she's stopping writing. No, the answer is no. (laughs) Yeah, she has published the book and the movie will end at her Colorado bookstore yet again, reading the end. Yes, it's (laughs) killing me. I know, it's so terrible. The point is that in the background, I guess the last twist of the movie is Henry Cavill with a country, Texas, something kind of accent. He's got a mullet or something. Yeah, he's got some kind of, I think he's playing an American. He is the real Argyle. See, you'd never guessed it. You thought it was Bryce Dallas Howard, but it was Henry Cavill the whole time. I'm really confused by this. I am so confused by this because, yeah, we were told Argyle was our Kyle, and we're told from Alfie that the books she wrote are missions she went on with Alfie, and so how is this guy the real Agent Argyle, and why would he out himself in a book signing, and why is his hair so stupid? Oh, I'm infuriated by this. Well, does it help that, yes, if you haven't stormed out of the theater like I did in (laughs) February, you do see eh, about three or four minutes into the credits. No, no, this does not help, Stuart. I wrote WTF. What is this scene? Like, what is this supposed to tell me? I guess he is a Kingsman? Well, again, they're saying 20 years ago and he's wearing an earring like from the 80s. I'm like, no, that's like a style 40 years ago. I don't know what they're doing here, but I guess... At the turn of the millennium, teenage Aubrey Argyle went to the king's man, ordered a cosmopolitan in such a way that it is a trigger to be handed a gun, and yes, is starting to work for that agency. And we cut to a poster of Argyle Book One and saying the movie is coming soon, which, okay, maybe Apple can afford the loss. They can write this off. If they actually made this, they're going to get Cavill, or they're going to get this guy? They're going to get this guy. It's going to be a prequel starring this actor, Lewis or Louis Partridge. I'm not sure which one it is. But he is going to be the star of Argyle Book One, the movie. And it's worth pointing out. I did not read it. Usually I do that. But as a tie-in to this movie, they have published Argyle Book One, By Ellie Conway. A.K.A. Taylor Swift. Yes, right. Taylor Swift's (laughs) contribution. This is a book I could buy like on Amazon right now and read it? Right now, you could go and read the, you could have the movie spoiled next time. If they indeed make this and we have to cover it, I will go and find that book, but I was not interested for this viewing. I don't care. I hope they don't make it. This is a bad commercial to sell that book. Yes, and it was revealed It was written by Terry Hayes and Tammy Cohen, not Taylor Swift. Tammy, Taylor, yeah, nice try. Uh Uh-huh, we know, we're on to you. Shit, the cat probably wrote it. I mean, come on. (laughs) But Matthew Vaughn, in interviews, A, said that this is the first of a trilogy of planned Argyle films. At least two sequels. Not anymore. I hear it's streaming well, so you can never discount. It probably would go straight to Apple, but maybe. 
I cannot tell how streaming calculates into dollars. I don't know that weird math. It's all fake. It doesn't make sense. I agree. It's like Bitcoin. Is it real money? I, it feels like not. But in addition, he's planning that this, the Kingsman franchise, and a unnamed third franchise of spy movies will all come together for a big crossover that culminates the series all together. Why is he pinning so many hopes on this film? I look forward to this right after they make the dark universe, right? I mean, yeah, okay, <laughs> you think you're going to make that, but you won't. It's hard, right? You dream big, you spend a lot of time, map, maybe not a lot of time, you spend some time mapping stuff out, but I'm going to call it out now. He will never be able to construct that because there's just no demand for it. But would you demand it? Jacob Stewart, do you recommend Argyle? Jacob. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a big fan of Argyle. I have a lot of Argyle socks. I think it's a, just a great <laughs> pattern and scheme. Go get yourself some Argyle and a sweater, whatever. But for this film, again, I'm so upset it's PG-13 because the number of the times I wrote the F word <laughs> out of frustration in my notes. Again, Sam Rockwell, the shining light of this film. And even then, he does not carry me all the way through it. He may be able to carry Ellie and do that whirly bird, but he can't carry this film all the way. It starts off not great and just gets worse from there. There's issues with the visuals, what's real, what's fantasy. Usually a film would play that and there would be visual cues, not just like the actor switching, but like style, CGI being good versus bad. Here, it's just all bad. And again, that skating scene, once you get to there, that like, just watch that. Go to YouTube, watch that. If you like that scene, then recommend. But it's so awful. The style... Matthew Vaughn, like, had a sense of style. Like, I think about X-Men First Class and, like, how cool that looked. And then I look at this, and this is, like, the Dollar General version of James Bond. It's not even Austin Powers. It's not engaging. It's confusing. The twists are obvious. I did not have any fun with this. Strong not recommend. Stuart. You know, I'm going to start with Kingsman first. That was the hope, and apparently that's the tie. That's why we're doing this. And part of what made The Kingsman such a surprising take on the spy movie was how organically it paired the stuffed shirt image, the stodgy formula of James Bond adventure with real 21st century concerns about class warfare and overpopulation. And you have this very relatable juvenile delinquent who was stepping into the lead and they're pairing him with this amusingly nonchalant Silicon Valley one percenter you laugh in part because, yeah, it's a parody of spy movies, but also because it just pushed the buttons. You know, it went there. It took comedy to the bleeding edge. And by contrast, Argyle is stale jokes, meaningless twists that, yeah, I thought were obvious, ghastly special effects. It's about as fashion forward as Pistachio Disguise and Austin Powers. Oh, you're going to that. I am. Spy farces from the 20th century that needed to be left there. And it's a shame because you do have a talented cast. I want to just highlight part of what originally got my butt into the seat was that I like most of these people here, but they are manically trying to raise a lead balloon. And the whole thing feels smug and tiresome and joyless at 140 minutes. It's just too long, and then you're right, when you hit that awful oil skating scene, like, it just can't get to the climax faster. The longer it goes, the harder it is to endure, honestly. It went from being shruggable, I guess it would stream okay at home, and I know when I was watching it again, I was like, well, I guess I don't hate it as much as I did in theaters, and then when, we, when you hit that last part, when we get to the oil tanker, it's all there still. The hate is still burning. This would only work if it worked as a rom-com, right? We have to want Bryce Dallas Howard to realize she loves Sam Rockwell so much that she's willing to get back into the spy game. But I don't believe her in this movie. I think she's a real hurdle to finding that movie inside what we're given. And it's actually sad to me that we had to tie this to the Kingsman series because it's clearly the worst installment of it. Solid, not recommend. I agree with a lot of what you said, but I don't agree with the volume you turned it up to, if that makes sense. First of all, 
this is better than The King's Man. No. <laughs> no, it's not. It's really not. I so strongly disliked The King's Man. But as far as the movie we're discussing here, I agree with what you said. That, as I said in the review, the moment that Ellie becomes our Kyle, the movie takes a turn for the worse. And the stuff on the battleship is really not good. It is a climax for the ages to show what not to do. The way that Brian Cranston gets taken out so easily, the way that that ice skating scene... I mean, Jacob, you say if you see the ice skating scene and like it, recommend. If you see the ice skating scene and like it, come to our Facebook group and tell me because I can't imagine anyone thinking that is a good scene. No, just check yourself into therapy, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) It's a bad scene. And again, it's a pale imitation of good scenes Matthew Vaughn has done. That's what makes me so mad, because I know he can pull a scene like that off, but what is that? Yeah, you took the word out of my mouth, which is imitation. This is a pale imitation of Kingsman. It's not even as good as Kingsman 2, which, big step down from Kingsman 1. Kingsman 1, one of my favorite movies. Kingsman 2, a movie I like. But this one... Between the energy Sam Rockwell brings and the fun that I have in the first half of this movie, I can eke this over to the weakest of recommends. Wow. Do you have a special fan edit that cut out all the bad scenes? Yeah, he's cutting out the second half of the movie is what I heard. I like the soundtrack other than the Beatles song that I didn't really pay any attention to. I like the score. I have fun with the first half. I have so much fun with the first half that it outweighs the negativity with the second half, and my negativity on the second half never rises to the boiling hatred that you two have brought out. I just dislike it, but I don't hate it, and so I had to weigh it back and forth, and Sam Rockwell, National Treasure, is fun to watch in this. Brian Cranston's fun to watch in this. Bryce Dallas Howard is okay in this. Weak recommend. Okay, you're definitely... I can see why you're saying it's better than The King's Man. I don't recommend that film either. I don't even remember that film, and I'll watch it before this one. <laughs> right. It was more dramatically serious, and they were trying to go for real World War I stuff. I give it more credit than this, which, again, what is the point? What is this about? What would a trilogy of this even be? I mean, book one looks like it would be the story of the true Agent Argyle. I wouldn't expect Bryce Dallas Howard or Sam Rockwell to reprise their roles, I'd expect it to be 20 years earlier and like The King's Man, just a prequel. But it's going to be like her dumb fiction that seemed bad. She wasn't a good author. So why would I want to watch a bad spy story for 90 minutes or two hours? It's a bad idea. I don't want it. I pray it doesn't happen. Do you want another Kingsman? I would love to see what Eggsy is doing. I feel like (laughs) that story, if you brought it back to him, maybe they went too far. I mean, they did kind of blow the whole institution up maybe there's nothing to go back to but i feel like if i want to come back to this universe it's matthew vaughn focusing on eggsy r-rated yeah r-rated and doing what they did in that first movie apparently still in pre-production is kingsman the blue blood which would bring back the actors from the first two kingsman films and then also the king's man the traitor king Those are both listed on IMDb as pre-production, and so yes, we would get Eggsy back and Colin Firth back. You know, God bless Matthew Vaughn that he wanted to explore interesting crevices, but they weren't that interesting. I guess what I would end up (laughs) saying is, uh, it only works if we really care about where you're going. And so far, The King's Man was boring, and this one was just stupid. And it all comes down to... Will a studio think they can make a profit on it? Will somebody pony up the money to bring it all together? And what will Matthew Vaughn do next? I'm still a fan of his, even though he's hit or miss. When he hits, he hits so hard for me with Kick-Ass, X-Men First Class, and Kingsman, the first one, all being some of my favorite films, that whatever he does next, I'll go to theaters and see. Sure, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't believe he should be exiled from, from making films. <laughs> just no more CGI cats, Matthew. Yeah, right, let's just start there. Yeah, no more of that. In the meantime, uh, we're not done with uh, action and buddy adventure. In fact, you know, we just covered that whole series of 80s buddy cop action movies 
here's a film that's deeply rooted in it, even though it's 2024. Bad Boys, Ride or Die. Will Smith and Martin Lawrence are back together. One of the best films I saw in theaters in 2020. Yeah, that's a short list. Yeah. <laughs> bad Boys, Bad Boys, what you gonna do? What you going to do when you slap Chris Rock on live TV and then have to make a amends and so you go back to a franchise that you really were popular in once upon a time? That has to be it, right? I would believe that Will Smith would want to be doing something else. Martin Lawrence, who knows? But Will Smith would like to be doing something else. He just won the Oscar, for Christ's sake. This isn't something that you, do, you have to do when you are a, anointed the best actor of that year. But yeah, he did something right afterwards that... I think atonement is the right word. Let's hope it works. Meanwhile, for Silver Level patrons and donors of $10 or more, this Friday, our Crow retrospective series continues with The Crow Salvation. And while I normally wouldn't believe that it would be salvaging anything, it's interesting Kirsten Dunst is here. Oscar-nominated Kirsten Dunst in a Crow movie. Who knew? Hopefully you can join us for that show and support Now Playing, keeping us going week after week. Whether we're covering Mad Max, Argyle, or Bad Boys, it's donor support that keeps us on the air. So Jacob Stewart, thank you for joining me. Until next time, hail Satan and have a lovely afternoon. I've had a rather emotional day, so whatever your beef with Eggsy is, and I'm sure it's well-founded, I'd appreciate it enormously if you could just leave us in peace until I finish this lovely pint of Guinness. Thank you for listening to this episode of Now Playing, and we hope you've enjoyed the show. That'll make you want to slap your mama right there. No, I don't think that'll be necessary. Come back to NowPlayingPodcast.com each week for another new movie review. Is that a proposal? Want more reviews like this one? In the archives section of NowPlayingPodcast.com, you'll find more than 1,000 in-depth movie reviews from our panel of hosts, including every movie based on Marvel Comics and more. Give me a far-fetched theatrical plot any day. On our site, you can hear reviews for every installment in the world's biggest film franchises, including Star Wars, Batman, James Bond, Middle Earth, Jurassic Park, Fast and Furious, and Transformers. I always felt the old Bond films were only as good as the villain. You can also compare notes with us on Letterboxd. Go to letterboxd.com forward slash now playing to see what our hosts are watching when we're not recording podcasts. And follow Now Playing on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Time to dance. Need more Now Playing? Subscribe to our In Focus weekly newsletter for exclusive digital download giveaways, behind-the-scenes insights, and more. Sign up through the subscribe page on our website and get it delivered to your inbox every Friday. Well, I, actually, we had an invitation, didn't we? Yeah, how did you know? Yeah, yeah, it came in the shape of a bottle. Now Playing is an independent podcast with no sponsors or ads. It's donations from listeners like you that keep now playing on the air. We ain't got much choice, you get me? And if we was born with the same silver spoon up our asses, we'd do just as well as you, if not better. You can join our crowdfunding campaign for early access to new episodes, exclusive reviews, and bonus reviews, available for a one-time contribution. Whatever's in that safe is the answer to all our problems. Backers of $10 or more will receive exclusive bonus podcast reviews. You've got a bit of a save the world situation here. You can also help out Now Playing by leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. A link to Now Playing's iTunes listing can be found at nowplayingpodcast.com. It's amazing. You will shit. Now Playing Podcast is produced by Arnie Carvalho. It seems we serve the same master. Associate produced by Jason Latham. I know you want to fight, but there are other ways of doing your duty. Now Playing is edited by Santiago and Arnie. Why is it that boys are always so messy? Now Playing Credit Narration by Brock. So you're going to teach me how to talk proper like a my fair lady? 
The Kingsman films, all audio clips and music used are the property of their respective copyright holders, and no infringement is intended. This podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by any entity that created or produced the well-known Kingsman films or comic books. Fuck this gentleman's shite! I'm gonna love killing you. Now Playing is an independent movie review podcast with no affiliation with any company involved in the publishing, creating, or distribution of that film and comic series. You know what that means. Then let me teach you a lesson. The opinions expressed at Now Playing are those of the individual hosts and may not reflect the opinion of Enganza Media Incorporated. Words to live by, Exit. Words to live by. Now Playing is a Vinganza Media production, copyright 2024, all rights reserved, and no part of this show may be reproduced, repurposed, or redistributed without the written permission of Vinganza Media Incorporated. It's the part where you say some really bad pun. It's like you said to Harry, this ain't that kind of movie, bro. Is that it? No one asked for another Amsterdam. Yeah, but she still might show up in Deadpool and Wolverine. Is that true? There's rumors she'll show up as Dazzler. Okay, all right, I don't buy. Rumors are lies. That is not true. Anything to get those Swifties in theaters. Yes, exactly. There's a song on her newest album that says the future is dazzling, and that's all people need is here is that she's playing Dazzler. Oh, there, yeah, I people calm down about the Torture Poets Society or whatever that album is. Like, wow, people go crazy for it. It's insane takes a train to visit her parents and work on the novel's conclusion. And Arnie gets heartburn. <laughs> I'm doing the Matthew McConaughey here from mm. <laughs> Wolf of Wall Street. I thought you were joining Wakanda. <laughs> <laughs> that Ellie truly deserves this, you know, Rachel Kelly, Argyle identity. Do you want to say that again, Rachel, Kyle? You said Rachel Kelly. Okay. I keep wanting to say R. Kelly as part of it. <laughs> she wants to prove that she's Rachel Kyle, badass. This isn't something that you do. You have to do when you are a- anointed the best actor of that year. But yeah, he did something right afterwards that I think atonement is the right word. Let's hope it works. I'm still waiting for G.I. Jane 2. <laughs> with jada pinkett yeah you know for a year my guest wi-fi was keep my wi-fi's name out of your f***ing mouth 